why don't we get started so that uh, people can come back and get a seat, pick up with some extra food, maybe some coffee. Environment, 
uh, that will expand in the recognition of our genetics and genomics research community here. So I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to open this 11th research symposium and look forward to uh, continued uh, progress by the GSI. Great. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you all for coming to the GSI Symposium. I am again Nelson Lau, the director. And we have five great talks today uh, in the oral presentation section. We opted for five this year instead of four to make the talks shorter and also recognize how much great genomics and genetics research is uh, happening here on this campus as well as the College of the campus. And so without much further ado, I'm gonna start out by introducing our first speaker. Uh, he is Jess Floro from Department of Medicine and he'll be telling us about a RNA binding protein, SCD2, required for efficient mRNA splicing. So when we first started looking at SDE2, it was actually proposed to have a telomere binding or telomere stability domain contained within it. And at the time, only a single paper was published on this gene. The work was done in yeast, and it showed an association of SDE2 at these yeast telomeres. And I'll just skip to the end of that story right now and tell you we found no significant association of SDE2 at human telomeres. So we're a telomere binding lab, we sought to identify that function of SDE2 at the telomeres. Um, but while we were kind of amassing this mountain of negative data, uh, we kind of stumbled upon a exciting and interesting observation. And that is that SDE2 is absolutely required for cell viability. And so what I'm showing here is data from the Broad Institute's Project Achilles. And what they've done is they've created a genetic dependency map in cancer cells. Um, they've done this by assigning an essentiality score for each gene in the human genome. Um, and so they're taking genes that are known to be essential, right? So if you remove these genes, cancer cells die, they're inviolable, and they've assigned them a median uh, essentiality score of negative one, which is exemplified by this kind of red line going across the graph. Opposite to this, they've identified genes that are known to be non-essential. So if you deplete these genes in cells, there are no deleterious effects on cell viability. And they've assigned them a median essentiality score of zero, right? And so on this graph, each dot represents a different cell line. 625 different cell lines are represented here. And so here we're showing TLX1 as an example of a non-essential gene. And you can see it clusters nicely around zero. And PRPF8, which is a splicing factor, you can see this is exemplified as an essential gene, and it clusters below negative one. So it's very much required for essentiality and viability. And what I'll direct your attention to now is this gene that I'm talking about today. SDE2, and you can see that it closely resembles the essentiality profile of this very essential gene. So SDE2 is required across the board for viability. So this is an exciting observation, right? We have this gene. No one knows what it does in humans, but it's absolutely required. It's such an important molecular function um, that cells must have it to be able to proliferate and stay viable. And so this kind of interesting observation really fueled the fire for the continuation of this project and really piqued our interest. And so when you go back and look at this domain layout of SDE2, I mentioned there was a telomere binding domain, um, but if you actually look where that telomere binding domain sits, it actually sits in this region, a much larger and frankly more important region of homology to a known splicing factor, SF3A60, right? And so this region of homology is also been identified as the nucleic acid sap binding domain. And here I'm just showing the sequence alignment and conservation between the splicing factor SF3A60 and SDE2. And so seeing this, we see this homology to a splicing factor. We wonder, does SDE2 itself somehow regulate pre-mRNA splicing, right? And I won't, uh, won't go into a full splicing lecture here. We don't have time for that. But I'll just uh, briefly talk about splicing and say that most pre-mRNA, when it's transcribed, it's transcribed as these coding regions that are called exons interspaced with these non-coding regions called introns. And through a series of biochemical reactions, you have the human spliceosome, which is this massive dynamic ribonucleoprotein complex that actually splices out or removes these introns, ligates together these coding exons, and 
creates a mature, translationally competent mRNA transcript. And so we're hypothesizing that SD2, because it's region of homology or known splicing factor that acts in this process, also may regulate pre-mRNA splicing. But how does it regulate pre-mRNA splicing, right? And so the first question we asked was that SD2 directly bind RNA? And to get at that question, we turned to an assay called GRIP, which is cross-linked immunoprecipitation. Um, and so from the basis of this assay, it uses UV cross-linking to stably preserve RNA protein interaction specifically. And so UV cross-link our cells, we IP, our favorite protein here, SD2. If SD2 is an RNA binding protein, RNAs should come down with that. And we can label that with the radioactive phosphate and look at that radioactive signal by auto radiograph. And that's exactly what we did, and this is what we see. So in our no cross-link controls, we see kind of a clean negative signal here, which is what you'd expect. There's no cross-linking, so there's no stable preservation of protein RNA interactions. And instead, when we cross-link, we see this very intense signal that comes down with our SD2 IP, indicative of the fact that SD2 is indeed a previously uncharacterized RNA binding protein. And you can see our IDG IP control here has no signal, so it's a clean negative. So okay, so we see that SD2 is an RNA binding protein. We predict it's involved in splicing. What does the splicing profile look like when you lose SD2 cells? And so for this experiment, we knocked down SD2 via siRNA. We did polygate purified mRNA sequencing. Um, and this analysis was done with Adam Labrador and Angel Dai from CAB, which is the Collaborative for Applied Bioinformatics. And they've been kind of instrumental in helping us with uh, all this bioinformatics stuff. Um, and so what I'm showing here is when you lose SD2 from cells, right, you have this massive increase in alternative splicing with up to 2,500 unique alternative splicing events and 1,500 unique genes that contain these alternative splicing events. So there are many different flavors of alternative splicing. I'm not going to go into every single one here. But instead, what I'll focus on, what I think is probably pretty obvious to everyone in the room, is the biggest slice of this pot, right? And that's the alternative splicing uh, event categories as a retained intron or intron retention. But remember that diagram I just said where the intron is normally spliced out? In this case, the intron is actually retained and incorporated into that mature mRNA transcript. So we see that SD2 causes alternative splicing, predominantly intron retention um, by bioinformatic analysis. But to validate this, we selected five genes at random that were predicted, again, by our bioinformatic analysis to give us significant intron retention events in our SD2 knockdown conditions relative to control. And so these are the five genes here, um, and we subjected them to RT-PCR. Uh, on the left, we have our control conditions and two unique SIs against SD2. And we're showing this each kind of uh, doublet here. The top band is represented of the intron retained band. And then one that runs above uh, lower molecular weight is indicative of a fully spliced band. And so you see in the control, this bottom band by and large is more intense than the top band, indicating that we have full kind of splicing and proper splicing going on in these cells. But in SD2 knockdown conditions, <coughs> you see the complete opposite. And every single gene here predicted to have intron retention, this top band is much higher in intensity than the fully spliced band, um, showing that indeed SD2 is causing this massive increase in intron retention, right? Um, and so if you quantify that, you see that things are uh, very much significant um, in all five genes predicted, so we validate our analysis. And then just as a negative control, this gene in red R of NG is not predicted to have any significant changes in the intron retention when you knock down the control. And again, that's exactly what we see. So I had mentioned that uh, just a slide ago, we have 1,500 unique genes, 2,500 unique alternative splicing events. But you'll notice I didn't say it was a global phenomenon. Not all genes are involved. Not all introns are retained, right? So we set up to identify what makes our retained introns special, right? And to do that, again, working with Adam and Angel from CAB, we set out to identify these specific cis-defining characteristics of these retained introns here to further kind of classify how SD2 might be regulating itself, regulating the uh, transcript form. And so one of the first things we looked at is the length of these introns. And to do this analysis, we broke up the introns into significantly retained, so introns that have a significant increase in interrupted retention with knockdowns of control, into non-significant introns, so there's no change in intron retention with knockdown and control. And then finally, non-alternatively spliced introns. So all the introns in the genome that are not part of these two groups. And you can see in this first analysis, we have uh, our significant retained introns that have a much shorter length than any other group of introns. 
Uh, going further to characterize these introns, we looked at the GC content of um, our retained introns. And GC content is kind of directly correlated with the splicing outcome here. And so again, in our retained introns, they have a much higher GC content than the non-significantly changed introns. And for this analysis, we took the non-alternatively spliced introns and actually separated them out into two groups based on length. And the reason we did that is because GC content is inherently associated with shorter introns. And so as not to bias ourselves, we split these up. Uh, but no matter how, how you splice the data, how you look at it, you can see that our significantly retained introns have much higher GC content. And so if you missed anything from that slide, all I want you to take home is that the introns that are retained are shorter in length and higher in GC content, right? Finally, we looked at the splice site strength of these introns, right? So we looked at both the five prime side of the intron and the three prime side of the intron. And again, we did the same type of analysis um, and split up these uh, introns into the same four groups. And you can see again, with our significantly retained introns, we have weaker splice sites, especially at the three prime splice site compared to all other introns in the genome. And so, and so in conclusion, we're looking at um, SD2 as this kind of uncharacterized RNA binding protein that regulates a specific subset of introns defined by these cis characteristics of shorter length, higher GC content, and weaker splice sites, right? And so we're able to say that SD2 is this essential RNA binding protein, absolutely required for viability in all cells tested. Um, and then again, it regulates this distinct subset of introns specifically defined by these cis characteristics. And with that, I'll say thank you and then acknowledge uh, my lab. Uh, Rachel's our mentor, uh, the Ganim lab, uh, this forensics lab who helped out with a lot of the RNA binding stuff, uh, my committee, and then of course, Adam and Angel who did a great uh, number of bioinformatic analyses for us. Yeah. Thank you for your time. So we've looked at the gene set enrichment of those intron retaining genes, and they kind of uh, clustered in mitotic division, DNA damage repair, and translation. And so I'm not showing the data, but we actually show that we have massive defects in mitosis that cause death of the cells. We also have massive decreases in translation that cause death of the cells. But we haven't really been able to pin down a single cause of death. It's likely we're dying from multiple defects um, just due to the breadth of the intron retaining genes across the genome. So we've pulled down SD2, um, and we have, it comes down a lot of HNRPs, it comes down to a lot of splicing factors. Um, the problem is that the antibody for SD2 is not super specific, but also non-specifically, but specifically recognized another RNA processing protein. And so we're not sure if what we're pulling down is due to SD2 itself, or this non-specific interaction with other major player um, in RNA processing. Great. Are there any other questions? Same question. Speaker is uh, Christian Gagnon. Is that correct? Uh, from the Charles River Campus Department of Anthropology. So we're going to get something of kind of a different flavor of genomics with uh, 
a study of UCP1, um, and its adaptation to irradiance in savanna monkeys. Uh, can you see? Can you use this? Today, I uh, am grateful to GSI for inviting me to give this talk today, the Anthropology of Representation. Uh, so today I'll be telling you about a project that we've undertaken in our lab over the last year or so. It's part of a larger project, so I'll give you some preliminary findings uh, about the UCP1 gene in vertebrate monkeys. So just to give you a little introduction to our gene, uh, UCP1 uh, in mammals plays a really important role in a process known as non-shivering thermogenesis. Um, this process uh, is cold-induced uh, heat production that happens in uh, brown adipose tissue uh, that is not associated with muscle activity, shivering. Um, the, um, there's also some other uh, potential functions of these genes that are related to non-shivering thermogenesis. Uh, including metabolic function. So the process by which uh, UCP1 uh, releases heat uh, also uh, recruits free fatty acids, uh, which are uh, then burned off by mitochondria. Uh, and this could help to promote some, uh, some uh, uh, benefits to the body. Uh, UCP1 uh, codes for a protein that is unique to mitochondria-rich uh, brown fat cells. And um, what this protein does is it uh, uncouples the uh, protons from their mitochondrial gradient, uh, which then causes heat to be released. Uh, so a study from 2017 done by Nishimura et al. Uh, found that in human populations, there were certain haplotypes of the UCP1 gene that were associated with differences in non-shivering thermogenesis. And they further found that the frequency of these haplotypes was associated with uh, certain uh, geoclimatic factors, including latitude and uh, average temperature. Um, so here, if we're looking at this figure, we see that the haplotypes that, are, uh, that cause an increase in non-shivering thermogenesis are more common in populations that live in higher latitude uh, where the uh, mean uh, annual temperatures are lower. So why would we want to study this gene in vervet monkeys? Well, vervet monkeys, we know, are uh, one of the most widely distributed primates other than humans. And uh, they are also found in a lot of different habitats with very different climactic conditions. And so this makes them a pretty good model for looking at thermoregulatory adaptations uh, in, in a closely related species to humans. So if we look at some of the, uh, the, the sample sites where uh, we collected our data, uh, we are mostly focusing here on the Hilgeri uh, tax, taxon from uh, Kenya and Tanzania, uh, where we see some higher temp uh, uh, minimum temperatures around 13 degrees Celsius. Uh, we also sampled some individuals from the Sinosaurus taxon uh, in Zambia, uh, where the temperatures are a little bit lower on average. And then in South Africa, we uh, collected a lot of samples from the Pugerichris taxon, uh, where even within their range, we see a lot of variation in temperature from the free state where minimum temperatures can get as low as two degrees Celsius, negative two degrees Celsius, and on the coast where it's a little bit warmer. So there were three questions that we were uh, trying to answer in this project. First, uh, was there a local differentiation in the UCP1 gene in our vervet monkey population? Second, was there selection uh, acting on this uh, gene region? And then whether uh, allele frequencies in gene uh, in the uh, putatively 
Right. Our sevens got all jumbled up there. So in, in the uh, sites that were under selection, were, were those correlated with climactic variables. So we formulated uh, two hypotheses based on these questions. First was that UCG1 gene uh, would have undergone selective sweeps uh, as they moved into Southern Africa. And two, that allele uh, frequencies uh, for the, the sites that are under selection would be associated with geoclimactic variables. And furthermore, we predicted that temperature would likely be the most significant covariate here that uh, would determine these allele frequencies. So our data comes from uh, a larger project, the International Burbit Research Consortium. Um, these, uh, this, um, the sequences uh, were done by um, some uh, colleagues at the McDonald uh, Genome Institute in um, Washington University, St. Louis, and then we um, had all of the bioinformatics done, the uh, formation of the DCF files at the Gregor Mendel Institute in Austria using DHCK. Uh, important to note here, all of the raw sequence data that we used in this project are now publicly available uh, online. So um, in order to get at these questions that we had, we uh, created this workflow that takes an integrative approach to looking at patterns of selection in a targeted gene region. And so we used a lot of different methods that are pretty well established, at least in the field of anthropology, uh, for getting at these questions. I don't have time to go through all of the methods here, but I'm happy to chat after uh, if you have any questions. Uh, but basically, we looked at population structure, looked uh, using the APC and looking at uh, the fixation index. We also uh, looked at different measures of selection using cardi weinberg equilibrium, linkage, uh, as well as uh, uh, integrated haplotype scores. Uh, and then we took a, an information theoretic approach to assess uh, covariate inclusion and ran some PGLS models. Uh, so looking at the phylogeny of uh, our sample, uh, we, uh, reconstru we were able to reconstruct the phylogeny, and uh, we, we see here in green the uh, Puderipers from South Africa, uh, Sinosuras from Zambia and Kilgari from Tanzania and uh, Kenya. And we were further able to uh, break these up into different subpopulations based on their phylogeny. So we split the Puget Reapers into four populations, Sinosuras into two separate populations, and then Hilgari, we had a fairly small sample size. So we were, uh, we just kept all of those together. Um, and you see that these kind of uh, line up pretty well here. So you see that Hilgari is spread between uh, lowland and highland Kenya, and we do have some samples down here in Tanzania. Uh, most of the samples from Zambia come from uh, southern Zambia, but they're split into two different sites. And then for Pugereperus, we have Free State, uh, which is kind of right smack dab in the middle of the country, and uh, a bunch of uh, samples from the coast here. So uh, population structure here, we're looking at a DAPC, uh, which shows the uh, level of genetic difference between these uh, different sample groups. And here we see a pretty clear differentiation between our uh, Zambian and uh, Hilgari East African vervets uh, to the exclusion of all of the South, South African vervets. This is expected. It's pretty much consistent with the, phylo the phylogenetic history that we understand about these guys. Um, and then we also see a pretty uh, wide range of variation even within a uh, single species, those uh, pugerebrus. Uh, taxon from uh, South Africa. Now the FST doesn't really show anything remarkable, pretty much supports what we see here in this DAPC. Uh, our analysis uh, found 21 SNPs that met the threshold for significance uh, in our integrated haplotype so score, uh, which is basically our main measure of uh, whether or not there's evidence of selection here. and 
and we see that uh, these are pretty uh, well spread out throughout the gene region. Uh, and we also have a lot of these uh, uh, SNPs uh, here on, in the uh, five prime end outside of the uh, actual gene region. Um, we did also identify a couple of regulatory elements, uh, including a CPG island here, which is more or less where we would expect it to be based on the position of the promoter region in humans. Uh, we also identified a, a pretty good sized linkage block here that spanned between exon five and exon six that included a lot of our uh, SNPs that were significant for a selective sweep. And uh, so for these that were in perfect linkage, we basically just chose one to be representative of all the others. Uh, so for our PGLS uh, modeling, we used a Brownian uh, model structure, uh, and we uh, took a look at the correlation between allele frequency and six different uh, covariates here relating to climate, um, latitude, elevation, uh, insulation or radiation, which is the amount of sunlight that's reaching uh, the ground, uh, annual mean temperature, mean temperature of coldest month, and mean winter temperature. And we got all of these measures from the WorldClim uh, online database. So here, I don't have time to go through all of the, uh, the findings for all of these different SNPs, but I'm showing the results of the extended haplotype homozygosity test for two of the SNPs that we found to be co correlated with geoclimatic variables. And here what we see is that there's uh, clear expression of haplotypes uh, that um, are being retained. Uh, and these are being retained by a, a, a large number of individuals within the population. So these are pretty uh, good evidence that there has been a recent selective sweep in these populations. Uh, the models that we found to be most significant uh, were the um, looking at irradiance and elevation in these two SNPs that I just showed you. Uh, and elevation also seemed to be really, uh, really a proxy for uh, irradiance in many ways. Uh, and we did find that even the second best model for this particular SNP was indeed irradiance, and it was significant. So looking at the results here, we clearly see that there is uh, a significant correlation between insulation and allele frequencies, and, uh, and the correlation between elevation and allele frequencies in our second SNP. So going back to our hypotheses, whether or not there was select selection on this gene region, we did uh, find that to be true based on our results and whether or not these were correlated with climactic variables, we also found this to be true, uh, but not in the way that we expected. So we expected temperature to be our most significant covariate here, but in, instead it was uh, irradiance. But this could have some in, important implications because in a really important behavior uh, in a lot of primate species and other animals for that matter is sunbathing, uh, which, uh, so it would make sense that uh, certain populations where they have less uh, sunlight reaching them, less the ability to warm themselves that way, would have other adaptations in order to counteract this. And so in the future here, we want to uh, expand on this study, add more samples. Uh, we also would like to fill a gap in our uh, latitudinal gradient by getting some samples from Malawi. Uh, and then we also want to get at the actual function, the functional value of these different variants uh, to see if there is actually a difference in gene expression. So there's two ways we might go about doing this. First would be to collect fat biopsies and then do single cell gene expression, or we could do uh, induced pluripotent stem cells into brown adipose. Might be a little more complicated, but that's another avenue we're exploring. And then some variants do appear to be exclusive to some populations, so we wanted to delve a little bit more into those, find out if this is just a product of genetic drift or if there's uh, selection happening. And that's it. Thank you very much. Any questions, Any questions for Christian? Yes. Uh, there is a new Turkey for coal. Say it again. Is there any chance in this population of something called coal? 
I'm not sure I understand the question. Coat color. Uh, it, you know, there is some differences between the taxons in coloration. Uh, I'm, we haven't looked at that, but that's an interesting uh, thing to consider. Yeah. If you have higher irradiation, you will absorb more. Sure. Yeah, that, no, that makes perfect sense. I, I think my advisor might want to jump in on this one. We actually have a colleague that's looking at this, and they have found that actually the populations in eastern Africa have darker coat color than the ones further south of the equator. So in the colder region, they have lighter colors. So it's opposite of what we would expect. Yeah. Activity of different variants of UCP1 in vitro with all these different SNPs that you have profiled? Is that um, a way of ascertaining whether the SNPs have some meaningful effect on the function of the gene? Yeah, so this is what we want to get at with those gene expression uh, analyses where we, um, all of the SNPs that we found were not found in coding regions, so um, we, we expect that these are pure, purely regulatory uh, variants. And so, yeah, protein-wise, I don't think we'll see any change there, but uh, in gene expression, it's a little bit better. Okay. Okay, any other questions? We'll thank Christian for a great talk. Um, our next speaker is uh, Lulu Jam from the Department of Pharmacology. She'll be talking about tau oligomerization, inducing integrated changes in RNA metabolism and disruption of nuclear membrane components. Small tau inference 
mostly oligomers uh, in how transplant mice are also parent tissues. So based on these two studies, we assume that the oligomers is a real toxic one. They correlated to our dining proteins uh, li list to the cell death. So well, to demonstrate this assumption, we extract the oligomers of fibrous, these two species from PS90 mice tissue. PS90 mice is the parental or express mouse model. So then we inject these two species, oligomers and fibrous, back to the mice have caps. Surprisingly, we found both oligomers of fibrous spreading the mouse brain. However, only all the oligomers showed those response toxicity. Fibrous are not toxic. And if we reduce PI in these mice, it, the, it, it blocks and reduces the generation and propagation of tau oligomers. So now we can have a camera conclusion. Tau oligomers is a real toxic one. It works with our body proteins uh, kill the neurons. So also, but it also raises up <coughs> other questions. Who is the first? Oligomers initiate the disease or are many proteins initiate the disease? And also, uh, we have the second question. What is the signal pathway of oligomers in combination with our many proteins uh, cause cell death? So with these questions, we start, started our current project. So we hypothesize how oligomerization started first, then it drives stress brain inflammation, induced the RNA binding proteins aggregation finally leads to the neural death. And to, to test our hypothesis, we decided to use the optogenetic tools. So that means we link our tau to optogenetic PRI2. PRI2 is a protein system to blue light. Once we shine blue light to this protein, it dimerize. And if we link tau to this cry 2 it will also dimerize this post to light. So in, uh, we have this cry 2 tau chimeras expressed, uh, plus, built in a plasmid, and then expressed it in the primary neurons. When we shine the blue light, tau will form uh, dimers, and in this system, we will observe the dynamics of our many proteins and the cell death. So we hypothesize this process will finally lead to the cell death. And here's how it works. We have the PRI2 protein here, and we have m used to PRI2 so that we can observe the dynamics of this process in primary neurons. In our experimental studies, we have a few metaphor R1 and tau linked to m PRI2. So from this construct, we will, we will see what a difference tau make to the system. So here's the uh, video. This is the negative control. If you focus on the arrow area, you can see the newly formed dimers induced by the blue light. So now here's tau. If you focus on position one and position two, you can see the newly formed dimers induced by light. This one goes up to this one. If you focus on position three, you can see those already existed dimers will combine together and form larger oligomers. That this shows how these uh, two videos show how the uh, system works. And based on this system, we will see what tau can make the uh, how tau oligomerization induce the signaling in the primary neurons. If we have only amateur PRI2 in the system, we shine light, they form dimers. We stop light, the dimers disappear. It's a reversible process. But if we have tau here, if you activate this process, they form dimers. And if you stop the light, at the beginning they can reverse. But if you extend the light more than six minutes, these dimers will never disappear. They will sustain for a long time. They even induce more and more dimers in the system, even though without, without light. And uh, to mimic the chronic accumulation of tau oligomers in primary neurons, we extend the time to uh, more than 10 minutes. 10, we have the time for 20 minutes, 40 minutes, 60 minutes. From this high molecule with, with tau bands, you can see the accumulation of 
uh, tall armchair quite two cameras compared to the more moderate cameras here. So uh, at the beginning we talked about we wanted to observe the dynamic dynamics of our dynamic proteins in the system. So here's how it works. We uh, select the TIA as a marker of our dynamic proteins. So under normal conditions, TIA is in the nucleus. It is daily globalized with DAPI, but if you shine light into it, surprisingly at the beginning you can see the translocation of TIA from nucleus to cytosol, and 10 minutes even more translocation. 20 minutes you start to see the globalization of tau uh, of TIA with tau oligomers. And if you stay in 60 minutes, you see most of the TIA outside the nucleus and they form large granules, globalized the tau oligomers. So this is uh, this can fit our hypothesis of RNA binding protein induced by tau oligomerization. A previous study said uh, has reported that our uh, tau oligomer tau octy will induce nuclear pore complex disruption. And in this system, we see the busy transportation of TIA from nucleus to cytosol. Easily, we can imagine that something happened in, uh, at the nuclear envelope. So we select lemon B2, one of the main component of nuclear envelope as a marker. And uh, in abnormal conditions, without any stress, without a tau polymerization, we can see the beautiful ring surrounding the nucleus. However, surprisingly, when you have, you have light here, we can see the disruption of this uh, circle. And if you have more light, more tau polymerization, you see the disruption of this nuclear envelope, and even it goes into the nucleus after a long time light spurred. If you look at 60 minutes of light, you see they form large gray aggregates inside and outside of the nucleus. So now we see the uh, a lot of things happen when you have tau polymerization, and now we're curious about how the neurons, uh, uh, how is the status of the neurons? Are they happy? Are they healthy? Are they dying? So we select the clinical TSP3 marker as a, uh, uh, apoptotic marker, and also map two stain to see the morphology of the neurons. And if you see with light repeated light activation. We see a highly increase of TSP3 signaling, and I will see the disruption of morphology, uh, neuronal morphology. The MAP2 dendritical length get much shorter. That means that neurons are dying in this, in this system. So, based on this, uh, 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 all these findings, we are curious about why the neuron, why tau polymerization induced RNA binding protein aggregation, and what is the signaling pathway family leads to cell death. So we uh, use the proteomic strategies to profile the evolution of protein, protein interactions and also uh, the uh, cell death signaling in this process. We pull down all the proteins interacts, uh, interacting with tau by magnetic address trees, uh, uh, the address piece, and then right mass back. And surprisingly, we found a large enrichment of ribosome proteins are RNA binding proteins in tau complex. And also uh, some cell death signaling and mitochondrial proteins here. If you compare the different time points, we have three clustering change here. You can see the difference of some ribosome proteins, this side, an increase of RNA binding proteins, and also the increase of cell death signaling, especially at 60 minutes of light, the latest stage of the process. You can see the increase of this neuronal death signaling and also the R, uh, RRA processing proteins and also the MRA processing proteins. That means the protein synthesis is disrupted and also the cell death signaling is initiated in this, in this system. And when uh, we are curious about the unique proteins in, in, at each time point, and at each stage, what proteins are interacting with tau? So here at 20 minutes, we see the uh, ribosome proteins and RNA binding proteins. At 60 minutes, in addition to these two clustering proteins, we have the cell death signaling and also the mitochondrial proteins here. Even more, we have the transport proteins disruption. The nu 133, nu 93, that's the main component of nuclear pore complex. That means the nuclear envelope is disrupted. 
We're curious about the similar pathway. We analyze the person protein interactions in the this system. In a few minutes, we see this RNA met metabolism cluster and also the ribosome cluster. If you look at the 60 minutes, in, in addition to these two red brain clusters, you see these blue brains, that is the additional uh, signaling pathway, in, including cell cycle, cell death, uh, means cell death and neurogenesis, and also the mitochondrial proteins means energy metabolism disruption, and also the nuclear pro complex proteins, and the vesicle trafficking proteins. If you think back to what we found at the beginning of this study, they all fit well of the uh, what happened to the neurons. The RNA binding proteins means uh, uh, here shows RNA RR metabolism clustering, and also the nuclear envelope disruption is the nuclear pro complex here, and also the cell death signaling, uh, uh, also the cell death related to cell cycle, and also the mitochondria disruption. Now we summarize all our new findings. If uh, at normal conditions, you can would tell us monomers the neuron function well. If you have tautomerized for short time, it's a rapid kinet kinetics of RNA binding protein translocated from nucleus to cytosol and localized in tau. If this kinet kinetics lasts for a long time, it becomes chronic and tautomerous will induce more mitochondrial proteins and cell, de cell death signaling, finally leading, leading to the cell death. This is the, uh, this is the story uh, resolve all our questions, why automerization is toxic and how it leads to cell death. And now uh, acknowledgement to all, uh, to our lab members and also our collaborators in BU and outside of BU, uh, also the funding source awarded to Dr. Wilson uh, from all these agencies. Thank you very much for everybody's attention and welcome for questions. Questions for Fu? I'll start off with one. Um, did you examine whether knockdown of TO1 also slow the polymerization of tau in the sedentary light inducible method? Yes, we tested that in this system. Actually, if we knock down TIA, it blocked the polymerization process. But in the kinetics, is the tau polymerizing before TIA and then gets out? Or that's just as with TIA, one is responding after the polymerization has occurred? Yes. Yes. If we knock down TIA before polymerization, the polymerization will be stopped. I see. Yeah. So, um, in Probat, when you you sustained with uh, mitochondrial proteins, yes. Um, are those uh, yeah yeah, are those like increase or decrease? They increase. They all increase. Yeah. The uh because it's a amateur pull down, that means the interaction of tau with these mitochondrial proteins is increased. It just means the tau interact with them. Yeah. This means the interaction. So I'm curious about your TIA data and why uh, you don't think that TR is uh, compensating for TIA. Presumably it's working through the prion like domain, the TO1 recruiting it there, and TR has the same domain and it's C permeance. Do you, do you see TR going to be used in solutions or think it has a role? Actually our colleagues in the previous studies uh, have the staining of TIA and TR. Actually, I think TIA react with tau, not TR. Right, and, and, and why, given they both have the prion-like domain, why do you think TR is uh, separate from that? Yeah, uh, it's really interesting, interesting question, but I have no answer. Yes, yeah, in the future, we may study on that. Yeah, what is the which domain really reacted to tau. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your talk. <laughs> now move on to Kritika Kari from the Department of Biology at the Charles River Campus. And she'll be telling us about uh, single cell spatial reconstruction. Thank you. 
reveals zonation of xenobiotic responsive long non-coding RNAs in the mouse liver. Uh, can I use this? Responsive link RNAs in mouse liver. Uh, just a brief background liver is a very hard working organ. Uh, it has a lot of functions involving maintaining blood glucose level, biosynthesis, uh, xenobiotic metabolism, and hence it exhibits an interesting phenomenon called as liver zonation. It is called a division of labor. And here is a small interesting. Over here. So the idea of liver zonation is that if you see liver, it's divided into eight different layers, nine to twelve different layers in um, mammalian liver. And in mice liver, we have eight distinct layers from pericenter to pericorpal. And the gene expression profile in the center versus the portal region of these layers is highly different. And depending on what genes are expressed in the pericenter, which are these classical markers here, and the pericorpal regions, which are the classical markers here, determines what kind of functions these layers will actually end up performing. So the pericentral layer is the center of glycolysis and xenobiotic metabolism, while the outer layer is involved with gluconeogenesis and gluregenesis. Uh, so from literature, what we know is that 50% of liver expressed protein coding genes are highly zonated, which is essential for maintaining the liver homeostasis. And it's not just prevalent in hepatocytes, but also the fact is that endothelial liver, endothelial cell liver zonation is essential for maintaining the hepatocyte zonation and making sure that everything is going the way it needs to be in the liver. Now let's briefly talk about link RNAs. So link RNAs are called long non-coding RNAs. There are functional characters, some uh, distinct characteristics that, uh, that we use to characterize link RNAs. So link RNAs are usually longer than 200 days per in length. Uh, they code, for, uh, they do not usually code, code for a protein. Uh, however, they show alternative splicing. Uh, they do express, but their related expression uh, as compared to mRNA is low. But they're highly specific in their expression between tissues and uh, different cell types. However, the zonation profile of link RNAs in liver is completely unknown and undisclosed. And this is what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, why we are interested in link RNAs? Well, the first time the field got interested in link RNAs was because of this gene called exist, which, le which lets or leads the females to exist. The reason being that there's a link RNA called X chromosome uh, exist, which is involved in X chromosome inactivation, and it's essential to make sure uh, that we have regular functions in uh, female phenotype. Uh, apart from that, there are surprising diversities with which link RNAs can interact. Uh, number one being that it can act as decoys. That, it, that means it brings different ribosomal binding proteins together uh, to, uh, for them to mechanize together. Uh, it acts as scaffold. Uh, it can also act as guide where it brings a protein to a DNA binding protein, uh, to a DNA or DNA to a protein or vice versa. Uh, it can also enhance uh, the activity of uh, interaction and trans uh, transcription processes. And it has many, many, many other uh, mechanisms that we are not aware of. Uh, the reason is that link RNAs can be easily characterized using bulk RNA sequence sets, et cetera, but their functional characterization uh, is still unexplored. Uh, and there are very few link RNAs that we know as compared to what we have discovered uh, in the literature and with different studies whose functions are well studied. Uh, so with which we're gonna see some computational approaches with which one can actually add some more meaning or information to link RNAs. So the biological question that we are trying to investigate is, can can we actually detect link RNAs on a single cell resolution in a mammalian liver? If that's true, uh, how does the interaction or how does the expression is heterogeneous across different cell types, uh, across different zones, that means pericentral to pericortal, and between the sexes, which is male versus female? And lastly, we are interested in xenobiotic responsive link RNAs because liver is the center of xenobiotic metabolism. So how many of these xenolinks 
are actually explained on a basal level that will give us some information for future research once we have data for xenobite exposure samples uh, to be able to characterize them better. So the methods here are briefly uh, based on the data sets that we collected from uh, publicly available uh, repositories for single cell data. So the first part of the data comes from uh, tabulum risk study where we have uh, approximately 2,000 cells from DropSeq study and 710 cells from SmartSeq uh, for late RNA detection, uh, marker identification, etc. And we use the regular uh, bioinformatics protocols like SORA, KISNI, etc. for visualization and analysis. So nothing great there. However, for the summation reconstruction, we are <coughs> using uh, an inference model called summation reconstruction algorithm published in 2017. And the concept here is that we use the SMFISH, or this paper basically uses the SMFISH information for some characteristic landmark genes. And landmark genes meaning that these genes are classically known to be expressed in one zone versus the other, and use their fluorescence intensity values to be able to then calculate a likelihood of each cell belonging to one of the eight layers. Once you have arranged the cell in different layers, then you can calculate the average expression of all the genes and the lithiases in this case, um, and see what their average expression is in these eight different layers, and then characterize them into different zones. So using that, uh, we move on to endothelial cell reconstruction. Uh, endothelial cells are relatively lowly expressed, uh, are more less prevalent in hepatocytes, and their landmark genes are not well characterized. Hence, what we did for hepatocytes is not that easily accomplished in endothelial cells. So here, there is another clever approach called paired cell sequencing, where we basically use two pairs. That means <coughs> you basically use pairs of hepatocyte and endothelial cells together, and then you sequence them together. And then using the hepatocyte landmark genes to characterize the zone profiles of hepatocytes, you can also infer the hepatocyte, the zonation of endothelial cells. So that's basically the method for uh, hepatocyte and endothelial cell classification. So the key results that we have from the questions that we were trying to investigate, we found that yes, there are link RNAs that are uh, expressed in different hepatocytes as well as non-hepatocytes. So out of the 15,000 link RNAs that we previously found in our studies, uh, we found 4,500 of them to be expressed between male versus female and in different cell types. Uh, if we talk about cell type specific uh, link RNAs, we actually have some examples uh, based on this KISNI where we have different cell type clusters in mirror, majority of them being hepatocytes, endothelial cells, NK cells, Kupfer cells, B cells, etc. And these are some examples of how you can see the expression very, very specific to each of these cell types. Uh, exists, which is the link RNA that we talked about, is highly specific in its expression for hepatocytes and so on. So that's another thing. Sex balance differences, where we uh, in our lab had known 300 link RNAs that were classically known to be sex biased. Here we're showing an example of three such link RNAs where you can see this is the female cluster of cells and these are the male cluster of cells. And the link RNAs are highly expressive and females are present here, highlighted, and then these are highly expressed in males, and we call them male-biased link RNAs. Moving on, uh, we talked about xenobiotic responsive link RNAs. So we also found a lot of link RNAs that are on their basal level expression expressed in these different cell type clusters. And now in the future, we have some data set that we can use and compare and contrast between the control versus chemically exposed uh, cells to see how their expression changes and how the cell, cell type morphology changes accordingly. But the main question is about zonation. So here we found 84 link RNAs that were highly zonated in their expression pattern in hepatocytes, which is quite significant here. So you can see this is the pericenter, and then this is the pericopal end, and this blue basically represents high expression, and then red basically represents low expression or lower expression. And you can see all these lists of link RNAs, a majority of them, and the ones that are highlighted in red are also xenobiotic responsive link RNAs, are prevalent in their expression in the center region, which kind of co co well correlates with the, what is known in the literature about pericenter, which is basically the zone for xenobiotic metabolism. So you expect this behavior to happen, and it's quite striking and interesting to see that happen. However, separately, we also identified 40 landmark genes, genes that basically can help you to distinguish between two zones, and are highly specific in the expression in endothelial cells only, uh, in case
case of link hardness. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about how this can be useful uh, in the next slide. Separately, we identified 69 link hardenings that are highly zonated between both hepatocytes and endothelial cell population uh, that we characterized here. Uh, using those 14 landmark genes, since we did not have a well-established catalog for landmark genes for endothelial cells, we reclustered our original cluster with 177 cells of endothelial cells. And now you can see that there is a characteristic difference between pericentral endothelial cells being separately clustered as compared to peripotal endothelial cells, which was not the case earlier uh, in the previous history. And the two cluster markers are represented here where you can see the expression is threatening based on the zones they have been assigned to. Uh, separately, you can use the landmark genes and characterize hepatocytes into their zonation-based clusters very, very clearly. So you can see peripotal male, pericentral male, female, and you have the midlobular in the center here, very well distinguished from each other. And some of the classical examples of those link RNAs that are zonated are presented over here. Now, how can we use this information? Well, this is interesting that we have some zone-based link RNAs. But one can now use this information to understand co-regulatory relationships between link RNAs and protein coding genes. And as we discussed, link RNAs are potential important regulators. So can these link RNAs, and the hypothesis is that can these link RNAs that are highly zonated and co-localized or co-expressed with protein coding genes are actually important for maintaining the homeostasis and maintaining uh, zonation. Uh, one of the examples of how this analysis can be done and why this can be important is that link RNA meet one, which has been studying the literature widely, uh, binds to BDX5 protein coding gene introns, right? And it regulates the stability, uh, and it eventually it can activate RIM signaling and colorectal cancer. So that's what is known. In our results, we found all of these three factors, all these three genes, uh, to be pericentrally zonated. So that means since they're co-regulated and co-expressed, and they're regulating each other, their zonation profiles has to match. And this is something that we can do on all gene-based level to get rid of the false positives that we get usually with link RNA co-expression with protein coding gene targets. Uh, so that's one example here. Well, that brings me to the conclusion that we identified here link RNAs that are not only just expressed in different liver cell types, but they are highly zonated. And we can use this information to provide insight on the causative role of altered liver zonation in different diseases across different conditions uh, between control and xenobiotic exposures. In future, we're going to use this information to understand more on the biological pathways that are altered based on zonation-based expressions and how we can validate these results using SM fish, which is a small example from Christine in our lab, who did this SM fish of this link RNA that co-regulates or co-localizes with this sick gene over here. And here you can see everything in green is basically representing that link RNA expression. Everything in red um, is basically the protein coding gene that we're looking at. And then anywhere there is a co-localization is basically represented in yellow dots. Now the figure might not be very clear, clear, but basically that's the idea. So you can validate, can validate the list of some of those uh, zonated link RNAs that we have discovered uh, uh, in using the SM fish experiments, um, and then see the effects of zonation the pattern post xenobiotic exposure. Uh, with this, I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. David Waxman, who couldn't be here today for some reason because he's traveling. Uh, Waxman lab members uh, who are here, uh, my thesis advisory committee, and new bioinformatics program. Thank you. <laughs>
procurement policies that don't seem to use the environment um, uh, with respect to that. Okay, so yeah, so in that case, you would write anti-sense to, to uh, Well, they're truly anti-sense, one thing I can suggest, mm -hmm. in addition to looking at their sponge effect, yeah. is that if they're completely anti-sense, they might promote the turnover, the degradation of the microRNA right. too. Right. So instead of just you know, pulling away from its normal targets, maybe it's actually causing the, you know, the, a lot lower level of the microRNA. Mm -hmm. right. Any other questions for Arturo? that was presented today, uh, there is a follow up work where we try to knock down a link RNA of interest, which is xenobiotic link RNA. Uh, why it's difficult uh, to do a knockdown experiment with link RNAs is because even if you link knock down a specific strand or in his mutation, there's no product to see here, right? So you need to knock down the promoter region, right, to make sure that we stop the transcription, which might have a downstream effect, and then validate it using single cell or single nuclei cell because link RNAs uh, that we are studying are highly nuclear in their expression. So that's uh, another area of uh, potential interest. Any other questions? Well, I have one more question. Yes. And since this is a single cell RNA seq mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of those library preparations are going to be dependent on the poly A tail. Yes. So Do you find, RNA. yeah, so, but there are many long encoding RNAs that are not well, so uh, you see a lot of them missing? Yes. yes. Like, which ones? Um, so, um, the ones that did not express or whatever, again, um, it's hard to characterize that uh, based on whether it's because they were not poly A is why we did not capture them, or it's because the link RNAs in itself are relatively low yield space as compared to mRNAs is the reason. Uh, dropout is another phenomenon that happens in single cell data, which is kind of makes even more difficult and challenging to see whether what you're seeing is because of a real artifact or it's effective artifact, but yeah, that's true, truly right that this is one of the caveats uh, of using single cell on link RNAs is because you might end up losing a lot of non poly Okay, any other questions? All right, thank you very much. <laughs> Last, but certainly not least, is uh, Chu Ron. Ron? Chu. Chu from uh, also Department of Pharmacology. <laughs> uh, and she'll be telling us about striatal transcriptomide profiling of HNRPH, RNA binding protein targets, via CLIPC in response to methamphetamine. And yep, that's it. Let's see, turn off. After Chu's talk, then we will uh, do awards. And all the speakers, please, please hang around for a uh, photo afterwards. Uh, before I start my talk, I just want to thank GSI for inviting me to do this talk. And for my talk today, I will be presenting my uh, eclipse seq data for identifying RNA targets of HNRPH in response to methamphetamine in the mouse striatum. And the goal of this is to understand the mechanism through which HNRPH regulates methamphetamine in a brain, uh, in the brain regions that are relevant for addiction. And this is a unique study in that this is the first ever CLIP study to look at um, drug, uh, uh, the effect of drug preservation on RNA targets in action. Uh, so methamphetamine is a highly uh, addictive psychostimulant with uh, no FDA approved treatment, and in humans, uh, the positive euphoria effect from the initial drug use can uh, often persist uh, subsequently. And in um, and in animals, in in, in rodents, methamphetamine actually increases uh, locomotor activity 
And that actually correlates to the increase in dopamine release in the mucus accumbent. And this increase in dopamine concentration in the mucus accumbent is important and necessary for, for reward learning. And given that this uh, acute response to drowsy abuse is highly heritable in both humans and, and rodents, we can take advantage of whole genetics to help us identify genes that regulate this acute response in the amphetamine. And in, in the help, it, and understanding this initial response to, to drug abuse can help inform us of better targets for, for intervention in terms of drug treatment sequel addiction. Uh, using quantitative trade locus mapping or fuel cell mapping, our lab is able to validate uh, this gene HNLPH1 to be a novel gene for regulating methamphetamine sensitivity. Uh, mice with a uh, heterozygous deletion in the first coding axon of this gene uh, show meth induced, uh, show reduction in meth induced locomotor activity. And that is not, and they don't show any di uh, di uh, differences in response to saline. In addition, these mice, in response to methamphetamine, they show this reduction in dopamine release in the mucus accumbent. And that change is not observed at baseline when they are not exposed to methamphetamine. Something I want to point out to you guys is that our mice is actually not a knockout mice because um, at the protein level, we have not seen any differences uh, of protein expression for the gene. The reason for that is because we don't have an antibody that can help us differentiate between the two, H1 and H2. H9, H1, H9, H2 share 99.6 uh, similarity in homology and we don't have an antibody can get, that can help us differentiate between the two. So at the protein level, when I refer to this, it, I can only refer to it as H and I PH. And surprisingly, at, uh, when we isolate the snapposomes, the snapposomes are synaptic terminals uh, is uh, isolated from neuron. At, in the snapposome, uh, these mice show an increase in H and I PH protein levels uh, compared to the wild type. So for, for the rest of this talk, I will refer to these mice as H1 humans. Uh, the, the gene codes for an RNA binding protein, so H and H1, and it contains these rep RNA recognition motifs to bind to RNA to, to regulate RNA processing. And we know that uh, dysfunctions in RNA binding proteins can have huge implications in diseases, especially in relationship to addiction as illustrated here. And H and RPH has actually been shown to, to uh, regulate the splicing of the new opioid receptor, and this have this, this could impact uh, addiction vulnerability in humans. And in in order to help us further understand the mechanism through which H and RPH1 regulates methamphetamine, we want to uh, we need to know what the RNA targets are for this RNA binding protein, both at baseline and in response to methamphetamine. So here's my hypothesis. So as I mentioned before, the, our H1 neuron mice contains a actually contains a deletion in the first coding, in the first RNA binding domain, and we hypothesize that. Uh, there would be genotypic differences in the RNA targets at baseline. And we also hypothesize that there would be differences in the RNA targets in response to methamphetamine between the wild type and our H1 humans that is causing the reduced addiction liability that we see in our animals. Um, in order to, to help us identify the real targets in a brain specific, uh, in a re in a brain region specific manner, we put the animals through a three three day behavior paradigm. So for the first two days, the mice are getting habituated to the testing environment by two days injection with saline, and on day three, they're either injected with saline or methamphetamine, and and the lower motor activity is reported. As you can see here. There is, in, in response to saline, there's actually no differences in the locomotor activity. But only in response to, I don't know why the text is cut off here. Yeah, in, in response to, to, to methamphetamine, which is this line here, you can see that there's, there's, a, there's a huge reduction in the, in the locomotor activity. And 30 minutes post-injection, we harvest the, the striatum, 
and subsequently get draft frozen. The reason we picked the Shire Islands is because this is a region that's critical for watering, and this is also the site for dopamine release. Uh, Jess already kind of talked about this in his talk, but I use, we use we use CLIPC to identify an iron target. So CLIPC involves uh, uh, cross-linking of the RNA to the protein using nuclear radiation, followed by immunoprecipitation, uh, followed by codon of the protein, and any so and, and the associate RNA that goes gets codon with the protein will subsequently get sequenced. And in parallel to the CLIPC, we also did uh, a prepare a total RNA seq library so that we can normalize and uh, the RNA targets that we identified to the gene expression for the target. Uh, I use a Sonia program called TRAM to uh, to to identify my, my to do the pre-coding analysis. So pre-coding is done on a gene by gene basis, and each gene is actually broken down into hundred base pair windows. And the program actually calls, uh, allow, uh, can can uh, count the map reads uh, within each of those spins and uh, and and give and do the analysis to see if the if one peak is significant. So here the uh, here is the example showing uh, a peak that is enriched to uh, enriched and is showing to bind to intronic region of this OPR and one gene. Okay, with this uh, I'm going to go into some of the data. Uh, so across all four conditions, we see that uh, the predominant binding region for H and R to H are intronic, which is not surprising because H I and H1 is known to regulate splicing. And when when RNA binding protein binds with introns, it can actually lead to uh, uh, intron uh, retention in the in the gene. And so the possible intron here indicates the site that are either 200, less than 200 or 500 base pair away from the five prime or the three prime spike site, and anything out is annotated as a distal intron. And using de novo motif discovery in whole, in using Homer database, um, we found that the, the binding sites are actually mainly enriched for these uh, uh, poly G tracks. And you can see that there is actually variation across the four conditions that we look at, indicating that there is actually differences in their mRNA binding targets. And this is in fact true when I did differential analysis across the four conditions to identify differentially bound RNAs to, to H and R to H in response to treatment and in response and, and in response to genotype. And so the volcano plot here on the left. Is showing uh, the differentially bound proteins to H and R TH between the wild, uh, between the wild type and the mutant. The reference group here is actually wild type. Uh, wild type. So uh, a positive log change means that there's in, there's increase there's an increase in the in the mutants. And anything that is highlighted green is indicating that is 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 meeting the, the FTR cutoff or less than 0 0.05, and there's an absolute log to whole change of greater than two. And, and the plot on the right here is showing those uh, uh, differentially bound targets uh, between the saline group and the, and the meth treated group. And the, in this case, only two, tar two RNA targets uh, meet the cutoff. So this DLGAB4 protein, it actually regulates organization of synapse and regulates neuronal signaling, so this implicates uh, a role of H and R and TH in altering uh, uh, neuron circuit ad adaptation in response to methamphetamine. And in another important gene that didn't meet the cutoff but show an increased binding to H and R and TH is SL66A1, which is a GABA transporter, which, which in this case is linking H and R and TH1 to. Uh, to inhibitory gamma ergic transmission to a tumor uh, response to methamphetamine. So if we look at the effect of genotype and treatment combined on differential uh, binding targets to H and R and TH, and and so here's what we find, and uh, so and here the positive log two fold change indicates those targets that are more that bound that has so increased binding. 
to to HNRK one in the human life, in the April human life, in these one season seven. If you look, if you look, if you look clo more closely at those uh, at those uh, top targets that needs to cut off of uh, less than two hundred oh one, and do catch carefully and emission analysis on those targets, we find a really high enrichment for amphetamine addiction. And actually, most of these uh, mRNAs codes for co-synaptic proteins that regulates synaptic plasticity in addiction, in drug-induced plasticity and in, in learning and in memory, which is really, really informative. And when we, if we look, at, look further into the interaction of those eight, of those top eight targets we identified in the original analysis, and look at the interaction across condition, across the four condition, a really striking pattern that we see here is that in response to MET, uh, there's an increased binding of these RNA targets to uh, to HNRKH in response to MET in the, only in the wild type, but there's an increased binding in our H1 human mice, and you can kind of see that across all eight targets that that we are looking at right here, and most of these are binding actually binding to these target regions of these genes, uh, indicating uh, changes in in splicing, and and in fact, in our proteomic analysis, we actually see a really similar trend in which we see uh, increases in a lot of differentially ex expressed proteins between the viral type and the H1 mutant in response to to methamphetamine. So it's a really it's a it's a pattern that we consistently see across RNA target interactions and protein expression. So I don't exactly know what this means, but it's a, it's a phenomenon that we want to pursue further. Uh, with, with this said, I'm going to summarize my talk. Here I'm, I am showing that uh, the uh, HNRPH associated mostly with the neutronal region uh, of the genes implicated as well as the spicing factor. So right now I'm working on doing some analysis to look at RNA spicing. Uh, in our uh, total RNA seq data sets, and and most of these, and we know that both, most of these binding sites are indeed for this poly G tracks, which is actually the canonical binding uh, motifs for a lot of these H and R and uh, family of RNA binding proteins. So you see here that there's more similar in terms of the top targets. There's more similarity between these two groups versus these two groups. And, and we also uh, identify uh, genotype by treatment interac uh, interaction on those targets that are enriched for amphetamine addiction. So increase in the wild type, increased binding in the wild type, and increased binding in the H1 human. Again, what you see is that there's more similarity between these two groups here than these two groups here. So, so our, our current uh, data set doesn't really tell us too much about how this increase in synaptic HNRKH1 is regulating meth induced dopamine release. We still need to kind of further uh, uh, do more analysis to look further into that. But since we have higher knowledge uh, telling us that uh, a, a perturbation in dopamine release is linking, linking, the, linking the influences in the behavior that we are seeing, then we, when, we, when we do the analysis, we can actually focus on those systems that, that affect dopamine release or those systems that, that are impacted as, as, as a result of the reduction in dopamine release that we see in the H1 human mice. So, um, so what we also see is that meth induce a rapid change in the binding of H and R and to a lot of these RNAs that codes for, for proteins that are involved in synaptic plasticity. So a single dose of a drug is definitely not enough to induce addiction, but the, but the neuron adaptation caused by this, the drug exposure can lay the foundation upon which further adaptation can occur. So in, in this sense, our data is, in, is connecting a link between H and R and PH to changes in uh, neuronal circuit uh, adaptation uh, involved in addiction. So with that, I would like to thank everyone that have helped me with the project in terms of the data analysis and the data collection and all the funding sources. And I take any questions.
questions for her too? Uh, I'll start first with, did you classify genes by how many peaks they had on average? Like, you know, how many actual clip peaks do you typically see for mRNA? So say that's a significant down MR. So the program that I use uh, kind of did, I, 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 I did check the program that I, that I use, and then did the, did the, did the all the stats for me that whatever the peaks that I identify to me is also <coughs> significant, but you can, uh, I also look, with all the peaks I, that I identify in the program, I also look, uh, look at the bed, the, the, all the band files into IGV and look at the peak alignments and see if that actually improves up. So I don't know exactly for, uh, for typical eye alignment protein, how many peaks you typically see, but if you know, you try to find a lot of things. So, right. I, if I, get, I have a cross, I have a diagram here showing the, showing the number of peaks. Sorry. So these are, you see a, quite a lot of peaks across the transition. And it's, it, it's, it's something that needs to further nail down on, but most of these peaks, it's a, these peaks are quite a lot. Any other questions? No? Okay, let's thank you for another. <laughs> and we are actually ahead of schedule. So we actually have uh, certificates for all the speakers. And I also get the privilege now of announcing who are the uh, poster award winners. So all the speakers, please stay behind and I'll present your posters. And let's give the, all the speakers another round of applause. <laughs> For the poster award winners, um, please hold your applause till I announce all of them. So, uh, one poster prize goes to Michelle Pan. Is Michelle here? Okay, if you can come on up. Uh, Justin English, you can come on up. Joseph Kern, are you here? Joseph, all right, good. So, here's Michelle T shirt. Justin, uh, Matthew Lawton. Here. Joe Kern, here you go. Um, Jacqueline Tursinovic. <coughs> Jacqueline, okay. And you know, we, we decided to open up more awards because there's such a great amount of interest in the GSI Sozo. So each of these uh, presentation awards comes with a $100 honorarium that uh, all these award winners will get. Uh, Jia Ru Zhang, are you here? No? And uh, Todd Dari, you here? Great, gotcha. Great. So, thank you all for giving a great post presentation, and thank you again to the faculty judges. Let's give all these guys a <laughs> round. All right. Um, say hi to the live stream. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and all the speakers, you can also come up for a group photo. Uh, and that concludes our GSI Annual Research Symposium. Uh, look out for more events with the GSI on the GSI webpage. Please sign up if you want to get all the emails and notices. And um, also look out next year for more workshop grants that we will be doing to encourage more single cell and single cell RNA sequencing, digital PCR, or any other type of cutting edge genomics technology we think that uh, we at BU should uh, investigate and try out. So uh, thanks again for coming, and see you again next year. Turn this back this way. I'll turn the live stream. Let's get all the speakers up.